We had 300 atheists in 2009 who came to the Creation Museum in one group. That was an interesting day. You know what's interesting? One of the atheists afterwards wrote this. He said, for me, the most frightening part of the Creation Museum was the children's section. It was at this moment that I learned the deepest lesson of my visit to the museum. It is in the minds and hearts of our children that the battle will be fought. You know what? The secularists understand. If we can get the kids, we'll get the culture. If we can capture their hearts and minds, we'll get the culture. And sadly, many of, of us in the church, we basically handed our kids over to the culture and we're wondering why we're losing them. In fact, I want to show you something. Here's one of the biology textbooks used in the public schools in America. We have most of the biology textbooks, earth science textbooks that are used in the public school. We have them in our offices uh, back at Answers in Genesis. And this biology textbook will teach students about the origin of life, the origin of animals, plants, and so on, uh, the origin of the universe, the origin of man. So it deals with all those issues and teaches them some good observational science as well when you know talking about cells and things like that. But notice what it says here. In science, you have to search for natural causes, for natural phenomena. Supernatural explanations of natural events are simply outside the bounds of science. By the way, who decided that science only explains things using natural causes and the supernatural is not allowed to have any part of science? Who decided that? People who don't believe in the supernatural. People who don't believe in God. Do you realise what this means? You know what the word science means? The word science means knowledge. That's what it means. It means knowledge. See, I have people who come to me and say, but hasn't science disproved the Bible? The Bible's not a scientific book. You know the first thing I do with those people? Excuse me, what do you mean by scientific? What do you mean by science? You know, I had one man recently say to me, now do you believe Genesis is a theological book or do you believe it's a scientific book? I said, could you tell me what you mean by scientific? And he said, what do you mean? I said, what I mean is, can you tell me what you mean by scientific? <laughs> And he said, well, I don't really know. <laughs> I said, that's a problem, isn't it? You see, what do we mean by science or scientific? See, the word science we tend to use for, oh, space shuttles and our technology and so on. But science means knowledge. Do you realise what they're saying in this textbook? Knowledge can only be gained uh, by looking for natural causes, natural events, naturalism. Supernatural cannot be allowed. Do you know, do you know, what, do you know what that textbook is doing? It's promoting the religion of atheism. That's what it is. It's an atheistic philosophy. And people, what we've got to understand is this, is that we have been misled in this country because many people have been told, oh, you know, separation of church and state, and we could talk about that for, for quite a while in regard to those supposed issues. Suppose separation of church and state, which means anything that's secular is neutral. And so you Christians, if you're on about the Bible and so on, you're imposing your religion on, on others. You can't do that. You can't have the Bible in the public schools and so on. So what's happened is many Christians in this nation have said, okay, well, we can't use the Bible in fighting the abortion issue or the gay marriage issue. Or we can't have creation in schools because that's imposing our religion and we step back and you know what's happened? They've imposed the religion of atheism. They've imposed the religion of naturalism. You see, the education system in this nation, like the nation as a whole, had a foundation that you start from God's word. And what's happened is this, due to the so-called separation of church and state issue, and really when it comes to that issue, I mean the phrase wall of separation was actually in a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists who are asking about states' rights. But you see, there's this idea today that, oh no, separation of church and state means, you know, if you, if you mention God, that's religious. If you don't, that's neutral. People, if you mention God, that's religious. If you don't, that's religious. You're either for Christ or against. You either walk in light or you walk in darkness. Remember what the scripture says in Matthew, he who is not with me is against me. If you don't gather with me, you scatter. And so we've got to understand something when they threw the Bible and, and prayer and God out of the public school. They didn't throw religion out, they threw Christianity out and they replaced it with the religion of naturalism or the religion of atheism. Really, public education, even though there are some missionaries in that system, has become an atheistic, an atheistic uh, educational institution across this nation that is capturing the hearts and minds of generations of our kids. 90% of our kids from church homes go to that system and they're being captured by the system. Psalm 11.3 tells us if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? 
Here's a barn that had a foundation that was, that was cracking and collapsing. And when the foundation finally collapsed, down came the barn. That collapsing structure to me there represents the collapsing worldview in our Western world. It represents these moral issues, the moral relativism that is pervading our culture in America and through our Western world. Why is that? Because a foundation has been removed and the structure is collapsing. What foundation? The foundation of the authority of the Word of God. And you know, in this day and age, God's word has particularly been attacked in regard to the book of Genesis, in regard to that history in Genesis 1 to 11. We live in an era of history when even much of the church has said to us, and many of the church leaders and our Bible college professors and Christian college professors and seminary professors have told us, you can believe in evolution, you can believe in millions of years, you can believe in the Big Bang, we just reinterpret the days of creation, we, we reinterpret the history in Genesis. That doesn't matter as long as you trust in Jesus. But people, what they have done is really take the pagan religion of the age. That's what evolution of millions of years really, really are. It's really the pagan religion of the age that the secularists use to explain life without God. And we, just like the Israelites, have adopted a pagan religion into our culture and it's contaminated the Word of God and we wonder why we're losing our culture. You see, as a Christian, when we say that you can add millions of years and evolution into the Bible and we reinterpret what Genesis clearly teaches, we do two things. One, we undermine the history that's foundational to all doctrine. But secondly, we undermine the very word of God itself. Let me explain to you. In Matthew 19, when Jesus was asked about marriage, he said, haven't you read? There's the authority of the word. Haven't you read in Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24, because that's where he quotes from, that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, this is the reason a man leaves his mother and father, cleaves unto his wife, there'll be one flesh. You become one in marriage because you're one flesh. It's based on the fact that the woman came from the man. She didn't come from an ape woman. If, if, we, if the woman came from an ape woman, you destroyed the whole basis of marriage. She came from the man. You see, what Jesus was showing was that the doctrine of marriage is founded upon Genesis 1 to 11. But not just marriage. Do you realize ultimately every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11? Why did Jesus die on a cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is there sin in the world? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is there death? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven-day week? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we need a new, new heavens and a new earth? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we wear clothes? Genesis 1 to 11. Do you think Genesis 1 to 11 is important? It's the foundational history for the whole of the rest of the Bible. You see, I've had many parents come to me and say, oh, when my little Johnny came home from school and my little Johnny uh, said to me he was taught millions of years or Big Bang or evolution, I said to him, you know what, Johnny, it doesn't matter. And I asked the pastor of our church and he said it doesn't matter either. It doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis. You know, th that's not that important how God did things or whatever. You know what's most important, Johnny, that you trust in Jesus. But friends... I want you to think about this for a moment. If we were born again Christian, we would believe that Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead. Is that correct? Let me ask you a question. How do you know Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead? Where'd you get that from? You got a movie rerun? Did you go back and see it? Were you there? How do you ultimately know Jesus rose from the dead? Where do you get that from? Oh, the Bible. Oh, you want me to take this authoritatively? Oh, but wait a minute. The secular scientists say a man can't rise from the dead. Shouldn't we, on the basis of the secular scientists, reinterpret the resurrection? You can't do that. This is the word of God. Huh. I suppose you people believe in the virgin birth. Where'd you get that from? The Bi oh, you want me to take the Bible seriously? Oh, I see. I suppose you believe that a fish swallowed a man. How do you know a fish swallowed a man? Because the Bible said so. Ah. Oh. I suppose you believe Jesus walked on water. How do you know that happened? Because the Bible says so. In fact, we could go all the way through this book. How do you know the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry land? And how do you know Jesus fed thousands of people as a miracle? And how do you know that uh, the walls of Jericho fell down? How do you know all these things? Because the Bible says so. And then we come to Genesis. And in the average church in our Western world, in the average church in America, the average Bible college, semin seminary, Christian college, when, when we go to Christian leaders, professors, when we go to pastors, elders, deacons, and we say, well, in Genesis says God created in six days, it was a global flood, Adam from dust, woman from his side, death came after sin. You know what we hear? Oh, we're not sure about that. Oh, we don't really know. Well, actually, you've got to listen to what the secular scientists are saying, and, and, and we've got to reinterpret the Word of God. And do you know what happens? See, do you know what happened in England? 
Back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, when the idea of millions of years was popularized by deersome materialists, people who didn't want to believe the Word of God, who were trying to come up with a so-called scientific justification for saying God's Word is not true, instead of believing Noah's flood laid down the most of your fossil layers, they said those layers were built up over millions of years. And you know what many church leaders in England did? They said, we can take the millions of years and reinterpret the days of creation. And along came Darwin. And they said, oh, we can take evolution and say God used evolution. Along came the Big Bang. Oh, we can say that God used the Big Bang. And what they did was they unlocked a door. You know what the door was they unlocked? You don't have to take God's Word as written. You can use man's ideas outside the Bible, reinterpret the Bible. People, what do you notice in Scripture when there's compromise or sin in one generation? Is it usually to a greater or lesser extent in the next? greater. And you know what happened? The next generation pushed that door open further. And the next generation pushed that door open further. If you go to England today, even most of your conservative churches will not take a stand on a literal genesis and stand back and look at the nation and say, can't you people see what's happening? You're losing the culture. It's an issue of authority. Now, when I speak authoritatively that, like that, I have people say to me, but are you saying if you don't believe in, 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 in a literal genesis and a young earth, then you can't be a Christian? No, I'm not saying that. Look, here's what the Bible says. In Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead and believe in a young earth and six literal days, you'll be saved. <laughs> is, that, is that what it's saying? No, it's not saying that. In fact, here's what it says. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's not a salvation issue, but you know what it is? It's an authority issue. You see, salvation is not conditioned upon the age of the earth or the days of creation, but it's conditioned upon faith in Christ. But here's my point. Where does the message of Jesus come from? It comes from the Word of God. And if you can't trust the Word of God over here, why should you be able to trust it over here? People, what's happening is we have generations today who, when you look at those seven seas of history, which is really how we summarize Genesis to Revelation, then you understand those first four seas, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, that's the geological, biological, anthropological, astronomical history of the universe that's foundational to the next three seas, which is the message of the gospel. We have generations today who recognize that if the first part's not true, how can the rest be true? Because we grow up in a culture in which we're being taught a geological, biological, astronomical, anthropological, archaeological history that totally contradicts the Bible. And so we have generations today saying, can the Bible really be trusted in this scientific age? Because for them, the world has bombed out the Bible, evolution, millions of years, and so on. And they're saying, well, what's the church going to do about this? The church says, well, trust in Jesus. But see, they recognize if the first part of the Bible, if that history is not true, then neither is the rest. And what we're doing in our churches and homes, as I said, we tend to be teaching Bible stories. And by the way, the word story today has come to really mean fairy tale. We even say to our kids, look at these wonderful Bible stories. But you see, for them, what they're being taught at school is the real history of the universe. We've been taught all this real history about millions of years and evolution and all this evidence. What are we doing at church? Stories. And we wonder why we're losing the next generation. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer, to give a defense and one of the things that we need to understand is we need to be preparing generations today to be able to stand on the authority of the Word of God and give answers to the skeptics of this age. We need to teach them, for instance, concerning Noah's flood, that Noah's ark was a real boat. We, we want to make sure we don't teach them the way many of our Christian books do, showing Noah's ark as an overloaded bathtub with giraffes sticking out the chimney at any moment about to sink, which teaches them as a fairy tale. We need to be teaching the Bible as real history. We need to be preparing them to answer questions. For instance, how did Noah fit all the animals on the ark? Well, he didn't need uh, all the different species or varieties. If you take dogs, they're all the one kind, the one family, and he needed two dogs on the ark. That's all he needed, and two elephants, and two horses, and so on. There was plenty of room on Noah's ark. In fact, the real question is not how did he fit the animals on the ark, but why did Noah build an ark so big he didn't need? And then we need to be connecting the flood to geology. If there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And by the way, that's exactly what you find. In fact, and look at the Scriptures. Look how it all fits together here. We, we're going to teach these, these, these children the Bible is real history and help them understand. Look, originally... God told Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, verse 29, that they would eat fruit. He said the animals would be plant eaters in verse 30. It wasn't until after the flood in Genesis 9, 3 that God said, just as I gave you the plants, now you can eat everything. As I say to people, that's the definition of a hot dog, everything. 
See, a hot dog has its origin even in Genesis, as you can see there. By the way, why did God change our diet? Because sin changed everything. Adam, if you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will surely what? Die. Death is an enemy. Death ended because of sin. But if you believe in millions of years, we need to understand this. We need to be raising generations up to understand, look, you can't be consistent and believe in millions of years and add it to the Bible. Many church leaders do today. Many of our pastors do, our, our Christian college professors, seminary professors. But if you believe in millions of years, if the fossil record was laid down millions of years before man, the fossil record has evidence that animals were eating each other. But wait a minute, the Bible says they're vegetarian to start with. The fossil record has evidence of diseases like cancer and arthritis and brain tumours and so on. Wait a minute, when God first made everything, he said it was all very good. He wouldn't call cancer very good. There are thorns in the fossil record said to be hundreds of millions of years old. The Bible says thorns came after the curse. You see, these two accounts of the past don't fit together. One is a perfect world marred by sin and now it's a groaning world because of sin. That's why there's death here. In, in fact, when Adam sinned, we forfeited, we and Adam forfeited our right to live. And so God placed upon us the curse or the judgment of death so our bodies would die, but our souls, we would live forever separated from God. But, but he already had a plan to step into history in the person of the Son of God to die on a cross, be raised from the dead and offer a free gift of salvation to save us from what we did. God wants to save us from what we did. But these two things, millions of years of death and suffering and animals eating each other and thorns and diseases leading up to man or the other one, a perfect world marred by sin and now it's groaning because of sin, you can't add them together, not consistently. And you see, children understand that. They start to realise when you take man's ideas, man's religion and add it into the Bible and reinterpret God's Word, you're undermining the authority of the Word of God. What you're really saying is God doesn't mean what He says here. We don't take it as written. That's why when I have parents say to me, but I told little Johnny, you know, it doesn't matter if you believe in millions of years in evolution as long as you say God did it because God could have done anything. And my answer is it's not what God could have done, it's what God said He did. And if you've just told little Johnny that what God said he did is not true, then you've just undermined the authority of Scripture. And by the way, as we do all this, we need to be helping them understand with even scientific evidence, as, as we do at the Creation Museum and in the resources at Answers in Genesis. For instance, when Mount St. Helens erupted May 18th, 1980, sedimentary layers were laid down. Thousands of individual layers were laid down in a matter of hours. It didn't take millions of years. Canyons were formed in days or weeks. In fact, even canyons through hard rock were formed over a period of two or three years. When you go to the Grand Canyon today, when you go to the Grand Canyon, you know you drive up because the whole area has been lifted up, the Kaibab upwarp, the, the plateau that's there. Actually, the Bible indicates how God ended the flood, raised up the mountains, lowered the ocean basins, the water poured off into the ocean basins. And when you go to the Grand Canyon, you can actually go to where you actually see that uplift. And when you stand there and you see that man for scale there and you look at the rocks and you analyse them, you start to realise something. Those rocks were bent when they were still soft. They couldn't have been bent over millions of years of heat and pressure because there would have been metamorphic processes, but there's no evidence of that. No evidence at all. They were bent when they were still soft. You're looking at what happened at the end of the flood. And see, the point in doing all this is to help people understand today, you know what, the history in the Bible is true. That helps us understand this is God's Word and that history is true. By the way, if that history is true, then the Gospel based in that history is true. Here's the bottom line. If God's word is true, we have an absolute authority of a basis for right and wrong. We have a basis for marriage, one man for one woman. See, when you start with God's word, we have an absolute authority. Who does determine right and wrong? Who determines what marriage is all about? It's only if there's an absolute authority that we can say, this is why marriage is to be a man and a woman. But if you say, no, we don't start with God's word, we start with man's word, then who decides right and wrong? You do. You know what it says in the book of Judges? When they had no king to tell them what to do, they all did what was right in their own eyes. Do you realize what's happened in America? America has changed religion. It's changed foundation from God's word to man's word. That change has occurred in our government. That change has occurred in the courts. That change has occurred in the education system. And you know the saddest thing of all? It's occurred in the church. Because when we adopt man's ideas into the Bible and add evolution millions of years into the Bible, when you take the, what the secularists say and reinterpret the Bible, our starting point is no longer God's word. Our starting point is man's word. What we're seeing happening in America today and across our Western world is the collapse of Christian morality, increasing moral relativism. You know why? There's been a change foundationally from God's word 
to man's word. When Penguin Books published their survey and said that two thirds of the young people in England, teenagers, no longer believe in God, a church spokesperson in England said this in response. Many of these results point to the great spirituality of young people today that the church is seeking to respond to through new forms of worship alongside traditional ones. You know one of the things that I've noticed in England, I've been over there many times and I see it in America as well, I see the way the church is responding to how the culture is going and instead of understanding the foundational reason as to what's happened, they look and say, well, um, obviously we've got to make the, the, the church more attractive. And so I see more and more of a watering down of the teaching of the word and an increase in entertainment programs to make the church look more like the world to try to attract the world in instead of giving the world the answers they need to understand this is the word of God. And I like to sum it up with these castle diagrams. Here's the foundation of God's Word and the structure of Christianity, those doctrines and the gospel that comes out of that. Here's the foundation of man's Word and the structure of secular humanism, moral relativism. You see, there are only two religions in the world. You either start with God's Word or man's Word. It started in Genesis 3. Trust God or you decide truth for yourself. I mean, that's it. And see, what's happened is there's been an incredible attack on God's Word in this era of history. God's Word's been under attack since Genesis 3, but the attack in this era of history is particularly being upon Genesis 1 to 11. Much of the church has said that doesn't matter. Uh, It doesn't matter how God did things. But see, this is the Word of God. We've got to understand, this is the very Word of God itself. It doesn't matter how God did things. As long as we believe the rest of the Bible and believe this structure, But people, that structure needs a whole foundation to stand or like the barn when the foundation collapses, the structure will. And we look out into the culture and we see the moral relativism, we see the gay marriage issue, the abortion issue, and we're looking at the collapse of the structure and and we're looking up there and saying, look at all the problems in the culture. They're not the problems, they're the symptoms. They're the symptoms of what's happening foundationally. And in fact, the church in America, Christian organisations have spent hundreds of millions of dollars to try to fight those social issues. But let me ask you a question from a big picture perspective. Has it really worked? The answer is no. And you know why? Because we've tried to change the culture. The Bible doesn't say go into all the world and change the culture. The Bible says go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel and to make disciples. We have got to be out there capturing for the Lord hearts and minds, raising up generations who'll stand on the authority of the word of God, know how to defend their faith, know that they can preach with authority because they believe the authority from which it comes, know how to give answers to the skeptical questions of this age and because it's those people that will be salt and light and change the culture. And people, you know, you know what's happened? Atheists have got themselves on school boards. Atheists have got themselves into those positions and they vote in accord with their atheism. And then when a Christian gets on there, they say, you can't do that, you're imposing your religion. And then we say, oh, I guess we are. And we let them impose their atheistic religion. That's what's really happened. As you think about this, I want to show you a video clip. Back in 1986, I was filmed in Arizona. And this is the message that I was preaching in America at that time. My wife and I moved over to America in 1987 as missionaries to a pagan culture to call the church and culture back to the authority of the Word of God. Now, when you see this video clip, you'll think it's my son. I look at it and say... What happened? Well, sin affected the world and me. But I want you to hear what I was saying in 1986 and what I was, in a sense, predicting would happen in this nation. And I want you to think about what's said and look at this nation today. How many people fight it at the issue level instead of saying, hang on, God's the creator, he sets the rules, let's see what his word says. The reason I'm against abortion is because God is creator, his word tells me, Psalm 139, Psalm 51, many other places, at the point of conception you're human, therefore abortion is killing. We are not the product of chance random processes, we are not just animals, God created us. What I'm saying is if we don't fight the issues at a foundational level, even if we get the laws changed today in regard to abortion or pornography, what happens when the next generation comes through who so believe evolution even more and reject creation and Christianity, won't they just change the laws back again? 
We have to fight it at a foundational level. There's a war on. There's a war in society. It's Christianity versus humanism. But you know, at a foundational level, it really is creation versus evolution. You know, the whole creation evolution issue is not just a side issue. It's one of the most fundamental important issues of today. And if Christians don't grasp what the foundational issues are, we're not going to be successful in the long run in evangelizing society. Would you say that that was a good prediction of what was going to happen in America if the church didn't start standing on the foundation that they should stand on, stop compromising that foundation, if the church just fights the issues? And you know, if you think about it, in America at this point in history, people think, oh, if only we can get a conservative president or conservative senators or conservative congressmen in, that's what will change America. People, you could do that and they could change the laws again in one sense in regard to some of these issues. But when you have generations coming through who are, are, are so much more secularized than previous generations and they get into power, they're just going to change those laws back again. The solution is that we need to be restoring the foundation of the authority of the Word of God, starting in our own homes and churches, and then dealing foundationally with these issues. We can't just go out there, we can't just go out there and fight the issues. Now, we've got to be salt and light, that's true. But people, if that's all we try to do, in the long run, we'll lose it. You know, there are many people today calling for a, a return to conservative values in America. What they really mean is they want conservative values, which are really what? Christian morality. But you can't have Christian morality without Christianity. You can't have Christianity without the Bible. And by the way, you can't have the Bible without Genesis 1 to 11. Ultimately, if you just call for conservative values, so to speak, in the long run, you'll lose the culture. You see, do you know what the answer is? People say, oh, we've got to get back to what the founding fathers believe. We've got to get back to the Constitution. I understand that. But in an ultimate sense, if you don't get back to the authority of the Word of God, you will lose this nation. And so what we should be calling for is a return to the authority of the Word. And so really, that's what our ministry is all about. Our ministry is really all about calling this church and culture back to the authority of the Word of God. It's about time Christians stop being misled and thinking that, oh, if we go out there and wave the Bible in the culture, we'll be accused of, of being religious. We'll be accused of imposing our, re our religion on the culture. We're letting them impose their religion on us, on the education system, on this nation as a whole. It's about time God's people went out there unashamedly, uncompromisingly, stood on the Word of God and said, this is what it's all about. Proclaim the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Show that we can defend our faith if we honour God's Word, remember, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's God's Word that's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's God's Word that will not return unto Him void. When we start standing on the Word of God, that's what's going to change this nation. Now that we understand the times that we live in and the foundational nature of the spiritual war of our day, let's go out there and proclaim the gospel with boldness, but do it in a way that people will understand, defending the Christian faith, giving answers what we believe. And let's commit to raising up generations who know what they believe about God's word, why they believe what they do, and can give answers to a skeptical world so people will understand the history in the Bible is true. That's why the gospel based in that history is true.